Welcome to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Future Leaders is part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, focusing on pharmacy student perspectives, interviews, and the future outlook of our pharmacy industry. This is Sean P. Kane, Assistant Professor and clinical, Critical Care Clinical Pharmacist at Roslyn Franklin University, and you're listening to the Pharmacy Podcast. Welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm your co-host, Tony Guerra, for the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast, broadcasting from DMAX Ankeny Campus. Connect with me on Twitter at Tony underscore PharmD or on YouTube at Tony PharmD, where you can find over 700 pharmacy videos supporting my audiobook, Memorizing Pharmacology, and the new book, How to Pronounce Drug Names, should be out on Audible uh, in a month or so, uh, on Amazon as well. Uh, today we're talking with Sean Kane, PharmD, BCPS, an assistant professor at Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science in North Chicago, Illinois, and a critical care pharmacist at Advocate Condell Medical Center in Libertyville, Illinois. Dr. Kane received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree at Butler University in 2010, completed two years of residency specializing in critical care at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And Dr. Kane is the creator of ClinCalc.com, an evidence-based clinical decision support website with educational tools for healthcare students and professionals. In addition, Dr. Kane is the creator and co-host of Helix Talk, Rosalind Franklin's University's College of Pharmacy podcast. Uh, welcome to the Pharmacy Podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, we want to get right into it. Uh, I know about you because I've listened to your podcast from episode one, the top 200 that you guys did and, and follow uh, every three weeks uh, as you guys get the podcast out. But let's get uh, our listeners to get to know a little bit about you. So Dr. Kane, before we get started, uh, what was your leadership road from Butler University in Indiana to Chicago as a PGY1 and PGY2 uh, to your present academic position? You know, I'd say when I was at Butler University, I kind of fell into some leadership roles. Uh, a lot of it came through professional organizations like Phi Delta Chi and um, through being a class officer. Um, and kind of as I got more into it, the more interested I became in, uh, you know, being a better leader and improving myself and things like that. Um, so at Butler, you know, those experiences really helped me transition to going into PGY-1 and a PGY-2. Um, actually, it was when I was a PGY-1, I started ClinCalc.com, which you mentioned earlier. Um, and clearly that has a lot of things related to leadership and taking initiative and things like that. It was my goal to do something that people hadn't done before with that website. And then as PGY-2, I was uh, the chief resident, so I had a lot of kind of more administrative responsibilities. That, um, I got to see some of the other sides of pharmacy residency and what goes into conducting a residency and things like that. And then now at my current position, um, again at Roslyn Franklin University, um, I'm you know a co-host of Helix Talk. Um, I serve on a lot of different committees within the college to um, you know, improve the quality of education uh, here at Roslyn Franklin University. And then obviously I precept, so I'm a critical care pharmacist. So um, certainly one of my roles is to serve as a good mentor and leader to the students that I precept on my, at my clinical site. Okay, well, tell me a little bit about this ClinCalc online, and, and maybe you can talk about FOMED in general. My understanding is that that stands for Free Open Access Medical Education, and uh, what you're doing with your podcast, what you're doing with ClinCalc online, is giving this information absolutely free uh, to anyone that wants to use it, and that is just seems to be something that's a bit of a trend uh, on Twitter, on social media. So tell me a little bit more about uh, what ClinCalc is, how it started, uh, and maybe where it might be going. So it's actually funny how ClinCalc started. Uh, as a PGY-1 uh, at UIC, we had an on-call program, which meant that we would stay overnight, have a pager, and get paged for everything from kinetics consults of vancomycin and aminoglycosides to antibiotic dosing, all the way to codes and strokes and things like that. So um, I actually created ClinCalc fairly selfishly because um, every time we got a vancomycin consult, it took a long time to do the math of how to dose vancomycin and then actually generate a progress note indicating that the pharmacist had reviewed the patient chart and what our recommendations were. So I actually created this website where it would semi-automate the process. I was still clearly involved in um, you know, the decision-making process, but this was a tool to help make me more efficient. Uh, so 
from creating this vancomycin calculator and having it generate a progress note for me, I kept doing more and more of these clinical calculators that would just make my job easier, make me more efficient as a pharmacist and help me provide better care for my patients. And of course, as an add-on to that, it was a publicly available free website and still is. So, you know, any other clinicians that want to have the efficiency benefit and the benefit of utilizing, you know, evidence-based medicine, they can use this website to leverage their own, you know, uh, clinical practice. Um, so that's kind of what ClinCalc grew out of was uh, that PGY-1 experience. And then it's kind of grown from there in a lot of different directions from mobile apps to, um, you know, beyond clinical calculators to as you mentioned, kind of dabbling a little bit in FOMED where um, it's more of uh, a review of, you know, a, a primary a primary literature article or something that, you know, uh, overall helps pharmacists provide better care for their patients. So I, I think the term I've, I've heard over and over again is scratch your own itch. That is, mm-hmm. uh, instead of telling other people what they need to do better, just make it a little bit easier for yourself and that problem may be something that you're also solving for other people. For me it was that I had students that had chemistry maybe 20 years ago or never even had chemistry and I've got to teach them pharmacology as an 18 year old, 19 year old and uh, what do I do? So I kind of came from it from a humanities perspective but uh, first scratching your own is kind of figuring out what it is that what problem you need to solve for yourself. But I've uh, also heard about IBM Watson And can you talk a little bit about how technology, because I started pharmacy school in 93, finished in 97. Uh, The big, big thing was that we got laptops. uh, And uh, so that was how long ago that was. The Internet was uh, just something fledgling Uh, when we were coming out. We were still using Netscape Navigator. But how Mm -hmm. do students work with technology? Because I understand IBM Watson, we hear that it's it's not supposed to replace the clinician, but to work with the clinician to go through all of these databases and make things a lot easier. So how do students um, up at Rosalind Franklin work with technology uh, as they're doing kind of these clinical uh, activities? You know, Tony, I think you brought, bring up such an important point in that uh, the, the pharmacist will never be fully replaced by any degree of artificial intelligence or a database or anything like that. There's so much art to medicine that you just cannot replace you know, a living human being who has a skill set from being in pharmacy school and uh, being trained and having clinical experience. Um, there's always this fear that people have of things like online calculators that, um, you know, uh, if a, a calculator can do it, why do you need the pharmacist in the first place? Sure, and sure. Mm-hmm. I, I always tell my students um, and anyone who uses the website is that this is a tool for you to use, it doesn't replace you. So uh, using vancomycin as an example, I always tell all of uh, the students that I precept that you gotta come up with a vancomycin dose on your own before you even begin using a tool like that. And the reason is that it takes one typo, one little mistake that if you're not critically appraising what the dose is coming out of a clinical tool, uh, you're going to make a drug error and hurt someone. So um, this is always a tool that is an adjunct to your own clinical judgment, and it's not the reverse where it is your clinical judgment. And that's such an important thing that I hope everyone takes away from that is that um, you know the, you, you still have to use your own uh, clinical thought process as opposed to just relying blindly on whatever the tool is. Yeah, I've heard that over and over again, that it's about getting the process right, and the technology will magnify it in whatever direction. So if you have a bad process, you're going to magnify that bad process. But if you have a good process, you can magnify that good process as well, which it sounds like what you developed through PGY1, uh, PGY2. Uh, But tell me a little bit about uh, what I just saw someone on Facebook today, very excited. Uh, She, I believe she's uh, with a renal team, and she got that job after PGY1. Uh, But tell me what it is to go from a PGY1 to PGY2. Is that something that you had set up there or you decided to stay in the same place or did you look at other different places? Yeah, so, you know, for personal reasons, I wanted to stay in the Chicago area. Um, Because of that, my options were fairly limited. Um, As a PGY1 or a pre-PGY1, I did specifically look at programs that had a PGY2 critical care component with the intention of potentially having that door open to me if I was to match at a PGY1 spot. And then when I became a PGY1 and I was looking for PGY2 spots, 
um, you know, obviously I was looking for, um, you know, critical care in, in particular, and I was open to maybe emergency medicine as well, but critical care was really what uh, got me excited and things like that. So um, I would say that for probably through my P2 or P3 year, I had a pretty good idea that I was going to end up um, pursuing a PGY-1 and PGY-2 in critical care, but um, it wasn't until I was really at my PGY-1 spot that I really thought, um, about the nuts and bolts of how that entire career path would work and how it worked out and things like that. It was a little weird for me to hear you say when I was in the match because when I think of the professors, I never really remember that. I'm like, oh my gosh, they all went through the match or they had <laughs> right. to go through the match too. You, you kind of, I don't know why, for whatever reason, I think, oh, they were so smart. You know what? They didn't even have to go through the match. They just <laughs> called them up and said, hey, you know, I'm your critical care guy. Uh, right. just, just take me. But, uh, I forget that uh, you know that that happens as well. Um, yeah. And looking at the the faculty you have there, uh, you have a relatively young group, which brings a lot of energy, brings a lot of new ideas. It sounds like you're trying a lot of new things. And when I say young, I mean you know less than ten years out. Um, yeah. I've been out twenty years, which actually makes I think me a liability in many ways. Which, <laughs> uh, that you know, it's like well. You know, and, and I'm sure they would be really polite about it, but but let's say I went to a faculty interview now, they'd be sitting there, you know, maybe asking like, so PowerPoint, Word, you know, maybe looking to see if I know those basic things. But uh, what do you think is uh, different, because we're talking about Gen X maybe versus the millennials, uh, what's yeah. the, maybe a couple of big differences you can tell me about your ability to connect with the millennials versus someone that is in a Gen X position like myself or, or maybe even a boomer generation, something like that? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I, you know, in, in defense of you and all of the other appreciate uh, it <laughs> older pharmacists out there, um, everyone's different, right? So you're going to get uh, Gen Xers who are more like the millennial and vice versa. It's just a label, right? So. Sure. Um, with that in mind, though, I think that any newer graduate that you get is going to probably be able to relate to some of the topics and the struggles of being a student better than an older person would. Um, and the reason that I say that is that even, so I graduated in 2010, it's now 2017, even over the past two to three years, I feel like I've become more disconnected and understanding the struggle of um, you know, the pharmacy student, more disconnected and uh, appreciating what they don't know and what I take for granted that they do know and things like that. So certainly with that younger faculty, they're going to have a better idea of what were common misconceptions, what are things that you have to delve into deeper because it's not a given that a student would know about a certain topic. And I think that there's a huge strength to that in terms of how you teach a, a pharmacy student um, because if you were there not that long ago and you know what it was like and you know what you struggled with and there's intense value to that as an educator to remember that and to, you know, harness that into being a better teacher. Yeah, I think a physicist coined that term, uh, the curse of knowledge, where uh, you've, the further you get in your education, the less you're able to connect uh, with the those that, you know, were kind of following your, in your footsteps. So even a PGY-1 or PGY-2, uh, so many things have just become ingrained. Uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is one picture to you where they're sitting there, you know, struggling through angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And, and so we have these kind of combinations. Well, let's let's make it a little more uh, academic. I guess I we want to do a little bit of interview, but also uh, kind of wanted to talk about this debate in uh, the American Journal of Pharmaceutical Education. I want to make sure I get this right. So it was 2016, uh, eight, number 80, article 37. Okay, and we're going. There's a point counterpoint uh, in there. Do you want to introduce uh, our two uh, sides of this uh, point counterpoint, uh, Dr. Cox and Dr. Svensson? Yep. So uh, Dr. Cox is of uh, the Texas Tech's College of Pharmacy. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Svensson is from Purdue. And basically the point counterpoint is fighting it out whether uh, fourth year pharmacy students or final year pharmacy students, when they go on their advanced uh, experiential education rotations, whether it's appropriate for those students to uh, take an academic or an administrative type rotation um, and count that toward their appy uh, or advanced experiential education hours or not. The, the debate is basically, um, should all rotations in that fourth year be somewhat related to the medication use system? Or um, given the uh, ever-changing role of the pharmacist in the future, is it appropriate to consider some of these 
um, more novel or different rotation opportunities, even if those newer opportunities don't necessarily touch the medication use system. I'm going to take a, a page out of the Helix talk where one of your two co-hosts would say, well, Dr. Kane, what is the medication use system? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. So. The medication use system is basically, and they have a great diagram in the article, but it's um, every aspect from drug development to prescribing, dispensing, administering, monitoring drug therapy, basically anything that touches drug therapy from beginning to end of drug development all the way to giving it to a patient. And that's the medication use system. Great. We'll be right back. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, are you talking to Uncle Bob for financial advice? Are you prepared to begin taking charge to secure your financial future? Hi, this is Tim Baker, a certified financial planner and founder of Script Financial. Script Financial is a fee-only financial planning firm dedicated to helping pharmacists and young professionals meet their financial goals. Budgets, student loan repayment plans, saving for retirement, it's a lot to figure out by yourself. Script Financial is a fiduciary that puts your best interest first when taking the proper steps to secure your financial independence. Schedule a free consult by visiting scriptfinancial.com. Script Financial, the prescription to financial freedom. Now back to the Pharmacy Podcast. Okay, well, let's let's kind of talk about these two types of rotation, the academic rotation, and we'll compare it to the critical care. Intuitively, I would think... A, a rotation with a professor would actually be the most difficult because you have the person that's most knowledgeable about a specific set of uh, maybe maybe it's so knowledgeable as you go to PhD or PharmD or PGY2 you become very good at a very narrow um, a narrow spectrum I hate to use an antibiotic term but a very narrow spectrum of knowledge um, but what the comparison was or if I remember right was versus the critical care which uh, you hear so basically you're the problem or your rotation is the problem is what they were saying that that you're taking the student from 6:30 a.m. to maybe 4:30 5:30 p.m. where an academic rotation might be more of a 9 to 5. Um, could you characterize the two types of rotations as you see them academic versus critical care? Yeah, so clearly like in a critical care environment you're dealing directly with patients and you're dealing directly with medications and you know especially in the critical care environment that's a very Environment where patients are very sick and um, you know one of the reasons I love critical care is that um, there's such a huge role of the pharmacist because of things like organ dysfunction and uh, the medications that we use literally can save someone's life um, in a matter of minutes to hours um, and there's such a big role for that pharmacist to play to make sure that we're giving the right antibiotics or the right drugs, that we're dosing it appropriately. Things like renal impairment are so common. So it's a very complex picture. And typically in an ICU, you have a, a ton of patients who are really sick. It's not like you're just taking care of one person. Sure. On the academic side, you know, you aren't taking care of patients. You're typically taking care of students, right? So you're figuring out how to run a lab or give a lecture or write exam questions. And it, Obviously, it isn't the same kind of stress, but for some students, you know, public speaking is extremely stressful. So um, it depends on the student, but clearly, like, um, the, the types of interaction a student's going to have, the responsibilities, things like that are just different between the two rotations. Yeah, and, and you make a good point. We are academic APPE here at DMAC. They would be in front of... Uh, pharmacy technician students. Uh, they would be able to interact with the other 19 uh, programs we have here in health and public services. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's definitely not get up at 630 because I wouldn't be here. Uh, I do get up. I get up early, you know, to work out, but I, I don't really get here till eight. And that seems to yeah. be late. Uh, and then critical care. Uh, it just sounds like it's a, it's a very long thing. You've got all of these different patients. And I feel like uh, I, I want to say getting up to speed for critical care or if you're, I, I hate to say unlucky enough, but if you hit critical care as your very first APPE or uh, how do you call them, APPEs? Uh, yeah. yeah. So if you hit that first, do you feel that that student is at a disadvantage? Do you think it's, is there something they should be taking before the critical care rotation? Yeah. I mean, to have a critical care rotation as your very first app or APPE, that's pretty brutal. Um, it, from a scheduling point of view, generally it's nice for the student to have a an inpatient medicine rotation under their belt, or at a very minimum, some kind of an internal medicine thing, um, just so that they can get their feet wet in terms of 
reading through progress notes. You know, if you think about how many words you could potentially read per chart per day, it's insane. So with the EHR, it's especially oh, yeah. so with that uh, copy and paste seems to be a <laughs> bad word that, that we keep hearing with the EHR. True. And with your PGY1, PGY2, were you already familiar with the EHR and it made it easier for PGY2? Oh yeah. So, you know, um, on my P4 rotations, most of the hospitals or many of the hospitals I worked in had Cerner uh, and at UIC we also had Cerner. And clearly because I was at the same institution between my first year and my second year, my learning curve for Cerner was basically none. And then I was fortunate enough at my current site at Advocate Condell, we also have Cerner. So um, to be super familiar with the EHR and be able to get where you want to go and find the information you need quickly, that's a, a huge skill that makes you way more efficient than if you're kind of struggling through that software. Sure. Okay. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about the, the points of view. Uh, so let's take uh, Dr. Cox's uh, point of view of saying that maybe an academic rotation isn't necessarily to become part of the academy, to become an assistant associate or full professor, but rather to be a good preceptor. Uh, I know that at the last meeting there was a, a lot of talk, uh, and I think it was in Anaheim, that we really need more non-faculty preceptors uh, out there volunteering to help these students. Uh, tell me a little bit what you think about in terms of uh, what the academic rotation can really do outside of just here you have to go to the academy. You know, I think that if you were to pull a hundred preceptors or anyone who interacts with pharmacy students, the vast majority of them will have never received any formal teaching or precepting education to help them be a better preceptor. Um, and that's you know, something that the, the world of pharmacy really needs to pay attention to because these are the people who are training our pharmacy students to be pharmacists, right? So we want them to be um, able to, you know, deal with issues that come up on um, advanced practice rotations. We want them to be able to um, identify when a student's struggling and, uh, you know, use their skill set to make that student successful. So it, in my opinion, precepting isn't something you can just fall into and you become a great preceptor it takes time and energy and certainly you'd be a better preceptor faster if you can have some kind of uh, formal uh, training even if it is one um, appy rotation to help you be a better preceptor yeah i think uh, students are surprised with how much non-teaching there is in being a professor or being a teacher i think they forget that they were also advised by the professor that the professor was on all these committees, that the professor has to prepare for, uh, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, and, and when we think of maybe education, maybe we think too much of the lecture hall and speaking directly to the student, not thinking about, okay, well, we flipped the classroom, so now what do I give the student and, and how do we uh, make them uh, learners within their own right? Well, let's look a little bit at uh, Dr. Svensson. He, uh, I thought I understand him as saying that the more clinical APPEs, the better, and that uh, residency is the place to kind of pick up that uh, paying it forward. So let's first get it right for you and then pay it forward. But what were your thoughts on Dr. Svensson? You know, I, I see where he's coming from. Uh, and one thing that I think is important to point out in his editorial is um, his personal experience and kind of anecdotally, he's felt that um, pharmacy students that graduate are not yet practice ready. Um, and on the basis of that, he argues that they just need more clinical experience and more uh, rotations and more more is better, basically. Um, and, you know, Dr. Cox kind of comes back at him and says, more isn't always better, that, you, you know, quality is probably the more important metric than quantity. And I, I think that there's a lot of truth to that. I think um, myself included, uh, I've heard of other students and uh, even my own personal experience, not every rotation is going to be a stellar rotation and I think that for those rotations that don't have high yield in terms of um, making you a better pharmacist or giving you a better feel for what you need uh, to know as a, a practicing pharmacist, I think that, um, you know, again, as a community, we need to think about how do we identify those rotations, how do we make them better, or how do we identify higher quality rotations to get us to that practice ready standpoint. Um, on your, I want to say it was the last Helix talk or maybe the one before it, you talked about and I hate to say the word good student versus bad student, so let's say more motivated student versus a little bit less motivated student for your particular rotation. They might be a stellar motivated student, but you just happen to be a required rotation. Um, 
can, you know, making, let's just say that you made them all uh, clinical uh, APPEs, uh, what would, um, what do you think that would do? That feels like it's very one dimensional to me. Um, but I think that no matter what, if you don't have a motivated student, I feel like it has to be up to the student to decide, yes, I'm going to put this much into it. And I think a student could get just as much out of uh, having two electives as they could have getting no electives if they were well motivated. But what do you think about the student's role in all of this? Oh yeah. I mean, I totally agree with what you said. So, um, motivation and uh, self-discipline and self-directed learning, these are things that you can't force a student to have and typically can't even teach them. You know, it's um, one of those qualities, honestly, that makes a great residency candidate is someone who does have those qualities. Um, you know, on many rotations, students can kind of get by and be able to pass and they'll do okay, but if they really want to get an excellent experience out of those rotations, they do have to have some degree of a self-directed approach of asking questions and having their own follow-up to the questions that they have and um, seeking out projects and seeking out more information. You know, that's super important to get the most out of a rotation. And typically a preceptor can't make a student do that. That has to be on the student's uh, own initiative to do that. Um, there's something that always confused me a little bit, or maybe with the new guidelines and Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that you can have a four-week, a five-week, or a six-week rotation, and you're allowed only two electives. But that means that you could have uh, an eight-week versus a 12-week experience. You're talking about a month difference uh, between any two colleges of pharmacy. Can you just talk about how your electives work or how your elective system uh, works at Rosalind Franklin, kind of maybe why you, you guys decided to use that particular experiential. I know that you are not in the experiential office, but uh, what was yeah. your guys' rationale for the way that you set up the uh, experiential part, which I think is, you know, just one step from being a pharmacist. Yeah. So, you know, kind of to answer that, I, I kind of want to go back to my Butler days a little bit to give kind of a good comparison. So when I was at Butler, we had, I want to say it was about 10 four-week rotations. Okay. Um, and I don't, I don't recall the balance of electives and not and things like that, but I had some awesome rotations and I was able to have some of these awesome rotations simply because I had 10 of them and I had a lot to work with. Um, everything from an underserved Hispanic clinic where I was basically speaking Spanish all day to, um, you know, time at Eli Lilly to see kind of the industry side of things. I had two different critical care rotations, which almost never happens. I, I really lucked out on that. So sure. I was just able to have you know, a wide variety of a lot of different cool experiences. Um, so here at Roslyn Franklin, we actually have six week rotations. Um, and we also have a system called a LAPI, a longitudinal um, API or APPE, okay. which means that students will go to a health system like Advocate or uh, Northwestern, um, and they will actually spend four of their six week blocks within that system. Uh, so. Condell is an example where I work. They may do a hospital rotation, an admin rotation, um, uh, transitions of care rotation, and then an ICU rotation all in the same building back to back to back to back. Um, clearly, the advantage to that is that you're not relearning an EHR every rotation. You kind of know the system. You know where to park. You know everything about the site. And from the site's point of view, they don't have to train new people every month because they have these people who kind of know what's going on. Um, when the LAPI system first rolled out here at the university, I was very opposed to it. Based on my experience at Butler, I loved the fact that I had such a, a rich diversity of experiences. Um, but um, now that we've had a couple LAPIs under our belt, I, I really can, as a preceptor, see the value in it. And I can see students being able to pick up the clinical skills quicker because they're not struggling through the EHR and things like that. So yeah, taking the administrative component uh, out of it in, in many. Absolutely. Uh, so that that kind of frustrating time that first day isn't really a first day uh, right. in, in the in the sense of okay I didn't know we had a student this month and that doesn't happen that often but but just kind of getting to the point that sometimes preceptors like oh my gosh that's right we have a student I forgot it was this day you know now we've got to get you up right. to speed and 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 how do you we, log in and yeah <laughs> how, can, how can we get all this ma and make it meaningful right. uh, quickly and um, I'm not from Chicago. I'm from Baltimore, and I know how big Baltimore is. Can you explain where Rosalind Franklin is? Because my understanding is it's in North Chicago, and Chicago is so big that means 20 right. to 25 minutes, <laughs> which which to me, I, I didn't know. I just thought Chicago was just this, here's Chicago, and here's not Chicago. 
Right. It's kind of funny. So like North Chicago, the word North Chicago is actually the city that we're in. So it's not like the north part of Chicago. It's literally North Chicago is the name of the city. Okay. Um, and we're actually probably closer to Wisconsin than we are to downtown Chicago. Um, so we're very far north. Um, so, you know, which is kind of good for our students because that means that students that are kind of up in the area um, have the opportunity to go to a place like Milwaukee and it's not terribly far away. And they can also go downtown and it's still not terribly far away. So we have access to a lot of different kinds of practice sites at um, our disposal simply because of geography that we're not strictly downtown and we're not strictly, you know, all the way up in Wisconsin, something like that. No, that makes a lot of sense. We were in Baltimore, but close enough to D.C. that we could have Washington, D.C. and uh, Baltimore. So it sounds like uh, something uh, similar, except we were we were truly an urban campus. Well, I want to keep the, the podcast uh, not too long, uh, but uh, how would somebody contact you uh, if they did want some more information? Yeah, so, um, you know, our information is available at helixtalk.com. We're on Twitter at helixtalk. And if you're more interested in kind of the ClinCalc side, um, it's clincalc.com or at clincalc on Twitter. Okay. And then uh, just to give us some uh, good advice, just a couple of quick hit questions here. Uh, what's your best daily ritual to keep your work on track? You're clearly a busy person, clearly a lot of responsibilities. How do you do it all? So my, my number one thing that I do every time I get into work is I make a to-do list. And I probably spend like 10 or 15 minutes figuring out what things I have to accomplish, what things I'd like to accomplish, what are some of the longer term projects or goals. And then I have my cup of coffee. And I, I have to do both, <laughs> otherwise it doesn't get off the right foot. Just that you do that afterwards, I, I'm, I'm, I have to confess that this was not my fault. The Dr. Oz episode was on, but he was talking about these four different types of sleepers and, and that some people are supposed to have coffee after they get up, like an hour after they get up, and then some people at noon. So it's just funny to me that most people, like, you know, coffee, then I can right. think. But it sounds like <laughs> you think then you use your coffee as, uh, I don't know, a turbo boost or something like there that. There you go. But, okay. <laughs> but your best daily ritual is to spend 10 to 15 minutes? Figuring out what I want to do that day. So, you know, hours into my day, I know exactly what things I was thinking about that morning. It's just a way to stay organized and uh, make sure you're triaging your time appropriately. Okay, and I want to say that many students are looking to have your exact path, maybe not exact path geographically, but that they've gone to pharmacy school, they've gotten the critical care PGY-1, they've gotten to stay in a city that they want to be in for their PGY-2. Uh, how did you, what good career advice did you get to get you uh, on that good road? Well, First off, let's be honest, some degree of luck has played a role in my ability to have the career path that I've had. Um, certainly part of it was, um, you know, hard work and staying motivated and dedicated and things like that. Um, I think that one thing that I'd emphasize to students, especially those who are more interested in leadership and entrepreneurship, maybe starting their own business or starting a new project, uh, there's this thing called imposter syndrome. Tony, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. Um, it's the, the, the feeling that when you um, are trying to accomplish something or do something new or different that you feel like certainly you're not qualified enough to do it and then you get the self-doubt in your mind. Um, everything from ClinCalc to Helix Talk to uh, a PGY-1, PGY-2, you know, many of the things that I've done in life, um, if I listened to that imposter syndrome and let it take over, I would have never accomplished anything. Uh, so. Even if you feel like you're not quite there, um, aside from doing everything you can to get there, you, you have to acknowledge that almost everyone has a sense of imposter feeling or imposter syndrome. And if you let that take over, you're not going to do what you want to do in life. And it's important to acknowledge it, but also um, you know, pass it by on the, on the road to success. No, I, I've heard that especially in uh, PhDs where you'll be around a lot of smart people who are very smart in their uh, particular discipline. So when you listen to them, you're like, oh my gosh, I'll never get there. But where we really struggle with the imposter syndrome being in a community college is that maybe our student didn't do so well in high school and they think that makes them necessarily a bad student now. And when I look on social and I look at YouTube videos, one of the number one questions I see students asking is, how hard is pharmacy school? And I think what they're asking is, 
am I going to get rejected? Am I an imposter? Am I somebody who, yep. you know, has to, I, I don't have the perfect A's. I didn't do the 19 credits I'm supposed to do according to the rubric, you know, on my college website. Uh, I didn't do everything perfectly. And, and my advice to them, uh, like you say, is uh, don't reject yourself. Let somebody else reject you and then move on to the next. But but don't reject yourself from applying. Don't reject yourself from a profession because you have evaluated yourself and in many ways, uh, you know, not the best uh, judge. Uh, let the admissions committee judge you and let the admissions committee give you feedback uh, because yeah. that's the one thing that I think uh, I think getting into pharmacy school, getting into professional school is much more about persistence than it is about perfection. But in their heads, it's more about perfection and and that's a great point you bring up well uh, last question what inspires you you know for me there's two things that inspire me one as an educator to see the PGY or to see the p1 or p2 student um, progress through our curriculum get to their p4 year have them on rotations and see them basically um, mature into this um, soon to be practicing pharmacist and it's such a cool transition especially in that fourth year to see them move from student role into I'm going to take care of patients and uh, do what's right for the patients. So that's one thing. The other thing that really gets me um, inspired and motivated is my clinical side. So in the ICU, making those great catches that dramatically uh, improves patient care, whether it's avoiding an adverse effect or identifying you know, a medication that is missing that absolutely has to be there or changing an antibiotic regimen to better cover a bug that ends up being this monster multi-drug resistant bug, you know, all of these things in terms of improving patient care. That's the whole reason why I became a clinical pharmacist in the ICU is to take better care of patients. So to have those those big wins always gets me excited for the next day to go back into the ICU and do it again. Well, it's clear you have so much joy and so much uh, happiness with your profession and, and your role and, and the city that you're in. So again, thanks so much, Dr. Kane, for being on the Pharmacy Podcast. Thank you so much. If you'd be interested in being on the Pharmacy Podcast, contact me at Tony underscore PharmD or Twitter, or you can contact me at aaguerra at dmac.edu uh, by email. Uh, if you're interested in sponsoring an episode of the Pharmacy Podcast, Pharmacy Future Leaders, contact Todd Yuri at pharmacypodcast.com. We thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to the Pharmacy Future Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag Pharmacy Future Leaders.